and gentlemen, it is I, Emily Sophia, here to break down for you guys the latest episode of Hannibal, which in and of itself feels like the beginning of a new season, but we are on season three, episode eight, The Great Red Dragon. So spoiler alert before we dive into the mad thick of things, as I shall be bearing all in this review, and thank you for your patience as I had kind of a crazy day the other day and was not able to film this when I wanted, but now we're going to talk about it and that's what matters. So let's get into it. Um, I, I was incredibly impressed by this first episode, of, of course, first in what is going to be the last run of Hannibal on NBC though what is dead may never die <laughs> and all of the death that has permeated this show i think makes it an apt candidate for resurrection somewhere else so i like many of you probably are am going to relish the crap out of everything that we get and once more to return to this episode it almost feels like the show hit the refresh button and it's it's as if we're back to ground zero but everything has completely shifted i think what is so magnificent about pulling off the red dragon storyline in the context of brian fuller's tv series is the fact that the relationship between will and hannibal is so much richer than I would argue most of the other cinematic portrayals involving uh, Will Graham and Hannibal Lecter. It's so incredible to see everything that we have seen transpire between these two characters. And so the forces that draw Will Graham back into this universe, back to tapping into the mind of Hannibal Lecter, it's so painful and so scary for us because we know just how utterly warped and twisted and perverted Will's mind became under the influence of or while he was curious about the ways of Hannibal. And this Hannibal in particular, Mass Mickelson's Hannibal, under the uh, direction of Brian Fuller. And oh, <laughs> I'm sending things flying on my desk here. But yeah, it's, it just feels so much more impactful. So it's going to be an incredibly exciting last run. Really surreal to be back in the world of Baltimore, Maryland, and to see just how far all of these characters have come. And yet, here we are grappling with the likes of the Tooth Fairy, a.k.a. Francis Dollarhide, a.k.a. a.k.a. the Great Red Dragon. Now, of course, I would like to draw a little bit of attention to the performance of Richard Armitage, who is now spearheading the latest portrayal of the Red Dragon. Of course, the Red Dragon character has appeared in the Michael Mann film Manhunter, which I still have not seen, although it is high on my list, way up there on my queue, as uh, my friend Diego, who I host a podcast slash YouTube show... Waffle Press TV Hangouts, he has emphasized that I must see this film, and I trust his judgment quite a bit, and so I do hope to see that soon and before the show runs its course and the season is done. And then there is also the Red Dragon movie with uh, Ray Fiennes as Francis Dollarhide. Now, I'm not going to draw a lot of comparisons between previous portrayals of the Red Dragon and what we are seeing now in the show. Simply because I don't expect everybody who is watching my review to have seen those necessarily. <laughs> it's not a prerequisite to have all your homework done before you show up. That's totally fine. And also, of course, I haven't read the books. Whatever. Now, this is going to be hopefully the one time that I say that. I just need to, to bring that forward because I know that people in the comments are going to be like, well, have you read, have you seen, have you watched, have you this, that, and the other thing? This will answer all those questions. <laughs> and unless anything changes over the course of the last season, that's still going to be the case. I'm going to work with the material that we got here today and say that I was super impressed with uh, the performance that we got for Francis Dollar Hyde in a silent one at that, aside from a few... Uh, fledgling dragon screams <laughs> in the darkness of his attic. Uh, 
yeah, just such a different episode. It felt so, it was much more silent, much more haunting and in brooding as Will Graham is being drawn back into the world of tapping into killer's designs, um, having finally started for himself a family and found some semblance of peace in another part of the world. So now he is, he is finding himself coming face to face with the ways of a killer who disposes of entire families and indeed perfect families as the newspaper headline states. Um, yeah, so as far as our friend Francis goes, it's the, the physicality of the character is I think one of the most fascinating pieces to watch, you know, as, as we see Francis attempting to, to become. He is longing to become this image of the red dragon from the William Blake painting. And in the way that he is trying to tap into this alter ego of his and to ultimately transform into this beast, it's so, it's so crazy. Because we, as fellow human beings, gen generally view ourselves and have our identities rooted in being human. <laughs> That's kind of the way of it. But such is not the case for Mr. Dollarhide, who um, we see in the way that he shapes his body in the exercises that he performs and in, you know, naked in the shadows trying to to sort of haunt himself up and to assume the form of this mythological creature. Um, we see him hunting down uh, some teeth, <laughs> hence the tooth fairy aspect of uh, the way that he's been portrayed by the media, of course, as he is known for leaving bite marks on his victims. but. Um, in the show, we don't necessarily see that aspect of his uh, M.O. emphasized too much. And even the the sexual nature of his crimes that have kind of been hinted at in or explored in previous mediums, I, don't, I think that we're really going to have to read between the, between the lines to find that stuff. Uh, the focus is going to be definitely elsewhere. As per Brian Fuller's lack of interest in portraying rape and sexual abuse things um, in the show. Anyways, so yeah, and then of course that scene with, with the film and, uh, and how like the light is bursting from his eyes and mouth and this, this crazy horrifying little scene. Um, seeing him of course after killing a family bathed in this blood that looks black under the moonlight. It's terrifying. And he also comes equipped with these crazy tattoos that again play into the appearance and the physicality that he's trying to, to draw into himself and to assume and become. And of course, the whole idea of becoming is very integral to the placing of glass upon the eyes of his his victims as they are to to witness him in in what he is becoming as he kills them um and that of uh, that too you know stems from the breaking of of the glass because there there's sort of this side of him that is that is frustrated by his humanness and trying to overcome that with this raw, visceral fury. And then sort of the way he expresses that in, in breaking glasses, in obscuring his human image. It's, it's so crazy, so brilliant, such a, such a fearsome and iconic character. And I think so apt for portrayal in this version of the Hannibal universe. Um, loved it, loved it. I am, I am very compelled. I mean, I was trying to live tweet this episode and found myself quite lost for words as I was trying to tune into all of the imagery that we are receiving. That was really key to this episode. Um, whereas Hannibal is a very talky villain who gets to say lots of clever and twisted things and usually deals with other people that say clever things that he twists. <laughs> we don't see that so much with the Tooth Fairy. 
he is a figure of a very different breed and I think is going to make for a huge point of fascination with Hannibal as he is working vicariously through and with Will to figure out what this guy is all about. <laughs> um, but yeah, so very impressed. Great performance on uh, Armitage, Armitage's part. <laughs> Oh man, that is that is a name that I shall befuddle inevitably in the days to come, but I'm super into it. Super into it. And loved again just how different this episode felt for the the quietness. And for as much as we had to focus on visually, and yet there there was a lot that felt more straightforward than episodes past because we're setting the stage for a new a new kind of horror. So it, we're not necessarily going to have our ears talked off and have too many crazy things thrown in our face, but I did especially love the way that they portrayed uh, Will trying to find the design of the Tooth Fairy. And he's very resistant to returning to his old line of work and the way that he used to be able to get into the minds of his characters. Now, something that I also appreciated about the way that the scene was done with Will walking through the house and trying to, well, become the one who becomes the Red Dragon is that, like, I know from the Red Dragon movie, I, I didn't super like the way that they had just the, the constant jump scares throughout because you're trying to take in the atmosphere and the ambience of this place like Will Graham is and then they kind of just throw these things in your face. That's not necessarily a bad technique at all. And the, the way that that film was constructed is very much as like a, a classic sort of thriller, but... It's so much more haunting with the way that it's depicted in, in the show and with the way that Will is kind of shining the flashlight into the dark, this beam into the past, and then the pendulum swings. And I, I was so I was so freaked out because I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to have to watch Will kill this family. And we see that to some extent. There are some things that we're shielded from, namely the deaths of the children, which do occur but are not they're not shown. The camera is kind of sweeping past. Just as I think Will is trying to sweep past um, the deaths. Especially since now he's got a kid and a wife. And these, these are the nature of his new livelihood. And so having to come to grips with and enter the mind of someone who, who destroys these innocent lives... I, d I can definitely see just the layers of trauma that Will has to peel back in order to be of use to the, the law enforcement that's trying to hunt this guy down. It's crazy, and it's not good. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was so beautifully done. And then, of course, when Will Graham, as the uh, the Tooth Fairy red dragon like with the the blood spatter lines behind him like these red wings of the dragon that was very beautifully done um very well directed episode as a whole lots of cool visuality that is still in tune with all of the absurdities and eccentricities of the show and yet kind of kind of muted as will is sort of kicking his heels into the ground as he goes. He doesn't want this, but he is being compelled by one whom he loves, his wife, to, to go forward with this, to do the right thing, and that she will remain constant even if he comes forth from this change. <laughs> and I just have to think, like, how much does this woman truly know of Will's past? of everything that's transpired, of how many times this guy has almost died <laughs> at the hands of the same guy who he's going to be having some tea time with as he attempts to find the Tooth Fairy. Oh man, what, what it is, blah, 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 blah. What does his lady friend know? That's, <laughs> that's what I'm curious about. Um, at any rate, so... I'll backtrack a little bit to the beginning of the episode where we see the incarceration of Hannibal who continues to live within and project things from his mind palace. So when he's having 
a meeting with Alana Bloom, it's back in his old office, at his old house. When in fact he is behind uh, glass, barring. Um, still, he's he's given quite a bit of freedom, all things considered. It's a pretty dang nice space, <laughs> which as uh, Brian Fuller showed on his Twitter, live tweeting during the episode the other day, that the design of the office was sort of structured on uh, Stanley Kubrick designs, so I think that was pretty cool. I think specifically from 2001 Space Odyssey, if if I'm recalling that correctly. But yeah, he's he's got a really nice pad, and because he's Hannibal, he can view it however he wants. <laughs> And then we also find out that he got off from the death penalty on an insanity plea, which we know is far from the truth. Now, we also get to see, um, what is his name? I am forgetting. The other doctor guy. F Chilton. Frederick Chilton. How could I forget the old bastard? He's back in the game, too. And he's got a little bit of a swagger in his step as at last the monster of monsters is behind glass and away from the world. And <laughs> after everything that everyone has endured, he, he of all people, has got some room to gloat. But I'm just telling you, a little bit of hubris <laughs> its going to go a long way. And then he tries to mess with Hannibal, of course, by talking up to Thierry and how he's even more popular than the, the niche interest that Hannibal has acquired. Um, but yeah, so there is a great game of chess being played yet. And ever does Hannibal have the upper hand? I'm just saying. Even if we can't see the invisible strings, they are there. And he has got them sewn into each and every person with whom he comes into contact. And like he tells Alana, whom he promised that he would kill her. Well, he always makes good on his promises. Just like he did in the last episode in helping to facilitate the death of Mason. So that's just a little, a little bit of comfort for you. <laughs> but man, it's... It was such a such a fabulous scene at the beginning with the arrest of Hannibal and we see him in this church scene. Um, again, what's interesting is sort of all the different perceptions we get to see that Hannibal employs, the way that he survives and endures and enjoys the world around him is by making it whatever he pleases. <laughs> he is a grand creator, and we get to see that displayed very well in this episode. Even with him not being free, arguably, he's got just enough freedom to do what he wants. And to even drop a line to Will, somehow, <laughs> writing him a very beautiful cursive letter telling him, oh, do not pass through the door, which, um, which Jack holds open. But he does. And just like Hannibal wanted, Will knows exactly where to find him. And ultimately, that's the road he goes down. So, um, yeah, this is, this is one episode that wasn't just constantly, relentlessly in your face. But it is the kind that gets in your skin and gnaws away at you for a little while. So, I'm very excited to see where things go. I think they are going to escalate like nobody's business. In the meantime, we celebrate the return of Will's sanity, <laughs> which I don't I don't know how long that's going to be staying in the picture. But it's interesting to see the Will who has attempted to leave his past behind coming to terms once again with the things of which he is capable. He will now be trying to employ the mindset of a Will Graham from a former life and uh, journey to the mind palace of Dr. Lecter. And it's going to be very exciting. Um, exciting, too, to see Alana Bloom back in her game. Chilton's going to be getting something down the line, if I'm not mistaken. I'll be curious to see if uh, Margot resurfaces in this part of the season two, but also we get, uh, we get Price 
prize back. And um, Aaron Abrams' character. Oh my gosh. You know, the the investigator guys. Ah! <laughs> Names. I'm so bad. You know who I'm talking about. They're essentially the comedic relief in the midst of the nonstop horror fest. So good to have them back. So good to have them back. There is really no organic way to place them in the earlier part of the season, but just the the general goofiness that those two bring to the table is, it's so necessary. And so crazy to see them and Jack and Will all knocking heads together once again. Um, and they do express quite a bit of surprise at the return of Will, which... I think all of us would. Um, but he is an older and wiser soul. And yet who knows what exactly that's going to mean for his his upcoming encounters with Hannibal. I can just see the, the smile in his eyes <laughs> as they return to one another once again. It's just like Hannibal wanted. I'm saying it's his design and everybody else. We're, we're back in the world of designs <laughs> and I'm so excited. So let me know what you guys thought about this episode. It, it feels very much like a return to form of previous seasons and yet, yet so fresh. It's familiar and new all at once. And I think that that's kind of the perfect note to go out on as far as this season is concerned. Again, I do suspect that there is more down the road for us with Brian Fuller's vision of Hannibal, but yeah, this was an incredibly um, haunting and visceral and lovely entry into what's going to be a relentless ride in New Time at All. So, thank you once again. Um, I will be back reviewing True Detective, other stuff in the near future, and yeah, that's pretty much the gist of it, so... As always, I will be back before you know it.